Thank the good Lord we have an opportunity to come in here and open up the Word, the living Word of the living God. All the rest of them are dead. Sorry about Dagon and all the rest of them. There's only one living God. <laughs> Father, I pray that you give me understanding in the Scripture and the gift of teaching and open the hearts of the people to receive your Word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, chapter number 2, and, uh, and verse number 15. And to bring you up to uh, what we've been talking about with Timothy, uh, Timothy, as you know, uh, the Apostle Paul says, my son in the faith, he called him that. And you know that his grandmother and his mother had, uh, had been directly involved in his salvation. 2 Timothy chapter number 1 and verse number 5, Lois, thy mother, uh, thy grandmother, Lois, and Eunice, thy mother, had taught him. So he was greatly blessed from the time that he came into this world because he had the truth uh, taught him. That's sad because the generation we live in today, all they get is a lie. Amen. They get, a, they get, an, they get a, a humanistic lie based on Darwinian uh, Darwinian evolution, no God. So in 2 Timothy chapter number 2 and verse 15, the apostle says to Timothy, he said, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now that tells you a lot because it tells you the scripture has divisions and it tells you to study the Bible. And the Apostle Paul rebuked the two on the road to Emmaus, not Paul, but the Lord Jesus rebuked the two on the road to Emmaus because they had not studied the Scripture. He rebuked Nicodemus. He said, Art thou a master in Israel and knoweth not these things? He rebuked Nicodemus because he wasn't conscious of the new birth. And so the, uh, the bottom line is that the Bible, the inspired Word of God, is the source of absolute truth. Therefore, we have to study it. Here's why it's necessary. Because you judge everything by Scripture. It may come across as nice. It may come across as, uh, as, as, as true. But until you can compare it with the Word of God and the revelation of Scripture, you don't know for certain if it is true or not. Because the only way you have any knowledge of what's absolutely true is the Bible. And this is why the Apostle tells you this over here in 2 Timothy. Uh, in second, let's see, 2 Timothy or 1 Timothy? It's 1 Timothy probably where he finishes up by saying, uh, let's see, oppositions of science falsely so-called. I think it's 2 Timothy. Is it 1 Timothy? No. He ends it up. Here it is. Thank you. 1 uh, Timothy 6.20. He finishes 1 Timothy by saying this, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, Avoiding profane and vain babblings. Over and over again, the apostle warns about useless arguments and oppositions of science falsely so called. Now, true science, and when I say true science, I'm talking about that which is proven, not just a bunch of uh, theory and conjecture. But true science has never contradicted the Word of God. But the scripture says oppositions of science falsely so called. Are we there today? Yes, we are. When kids go to school, they're told, taught in classroom that, uh, that the uh, Darwinian evolutionary theory uh, of uh, natural selection, the rest of it, is true, which it is not true. Because there are two basic lines of thought that have to do with the origins of man. And in verse number 15, you have to study to show yourself approved to God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. So what division are we talking about? How would we divide the word of God? We don't twist it to our own destruction. Well, that's where you get in trouble. And, uh, but what division are we talking about? Well, the basic divisions in the Old Testament are these. The law, the prophets, and the writings. The Navim, the Ketuvim, and the Torah. That's the three basic divisions of the Old Testament. The Torah is the law, the Navim are the prophets, and the Ketuvim are the writings, all right? 
You'll find that in any Jewish synagogue and anywhere you study, you'll find that these are the three basic divisions of the Old Testament. The Jews had that division long before America was ever America. You see, these are basic divisions. Another basic division is the Old Testament and the New Testament. Another basic division is the law and grace. And you can't mix the two together. Another basic division is the revelation of the dispensations of God. By dispensation, I mean a period of time where God deals with men according to a covenant, set standard, revelation, or whatever. That is a dispensation. The apostle said, have you heard of the dispensation of the grace of God? Another basic division of the Bible is the Jew, the Gentile, and the church of God. They're basic divisions in Scripture. One of, the, one of the things that gets people in trouble so quickly is what's called eschatology, from the Greek word eschatos, which is the doctrine of last things. If you are premillennial, postmillennial, or amillennial, it makes all the difference in the world in the way you interpret the Bible and the way you set up your church polity. Polity simply has to do with the organization of the church and what it represents in its ministry in the world. I'm premillennial, not post, not ah. I'm also pre-tribulation. I believe in the time of Jacob's trouble. I believe the church is going to be caught out before the tribulation period. So therefore, I am premillennial. I believe that the Lord Jesus is going to literally reign on this earth for a thousand years. But I am also pre-tribulation. There are those who are post-tribulation but are premillennial. There are those who are mid-tribulation and are premillennial. But I am pre-tribulation, premillennial. What does pre-tribulation mean? That means that the church of the living God will be caught out of this world before the time of Jacob's trouble, the seven years of the 70th week of Daniel, the seven years of tribulation coming on this earth. That in itself is divided. The first three and one half years is the tribulation. The last three and one half years is the great tribulation. So the divisions continue on and on and on and on. And in order to rightly divide the Bible, <coughs> you must be conscious of these divisions. And if you're not, what you'll do is you'll take truth that was relative for the day. For example, uh, in the book of Ecclesiastes, this is the whole duty of man. Let's go back and read it and I'll show it to you. Ecclesiastes. Uh, the word Ecclesiastes means the preacher. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Here we go. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. And look at this thing over here. Look at the last. Who wrote Ecclesiastes? That's exactly right. He wrote three books. He wrote the Proverbs. He wrote the Ecclesiastes. And he wrote the Song of Solomon. That in itself is another division. Because the last book he wrote was Ecclesiastes. He wrote that in the sunset of his life. He wrote the book of Proverbs in the middle area, time of his life. And he wrote the Song of Solomon when he was young and full of love and understood the love of God. And so you can see the progression in his understanding and his bitterness because the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter, the last chapter of Ecclesiastes, chapter number 12 and verse number 13. I want you to look at that carefully now. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. evil. All right. Now, when that was written and, uh, and it was read and accepted, it was accepted in faith, and it was the truth because this is all they knew. But remember... The angels desire to look into those things that you know. The prophets prophesied and desired to know but did not know. But now you do know and you're looking backward. Here they're looking forward. Note carefully. Is Jesus in there? Is the grace of God in there? Is there anything about the church of God in there? Nothing. So here is a sure mark of a cult. If somebody tries to run you to Ecclesiastes or any Old Testament book to try to cloud New Testament revelation, you've got a heretic on your hands. And inevitably, they will always diminish the work of the Lord Jesus Christ because the work is finished. 
and the, uh, to run to Ecclesiastes when you full well know, and these heretics know, when you full well know that you have 27 books of New Testament Scripture uh, uh, culminating in the book of Revelation where Christ is exalted as the Lord God Almighty, Revelation 1.8, and you run back to the Old Testament and try to diminish who He is and His character and His essence, you've got a rank her heretic on your hands. Anytime you find somebody who spends all their time preaching from the Old Testament, you got a problem. You got a problem. You say, well, are you casting aspersion on the Old Testament? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Beginning at Moses and the prophets, he expounded to them in all things pertaining to himself. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. All right? And when I read what this heretic said the other day on the internet, and I tried to tell you about that, where he quoted that scripture, but he took part of it out. He took part out, the part that he wanted to take out to suit his position. You see, what he was trying to teach people, <laughs> and has been for some time, is I told you, he said, the Bible is not the truth. Does that, is that a shocking statement? Could you imagine somebody say that? The Bible is not the truth. The Bible is a relevant truth to be judged by your spiritual experience. And I'm not putting words in his mouth. That's exactly what he says. I have a spiritual understanding and experience of Jesus Christ. Therefore, I judge what I read in the Bible by that. No, no friend, you judge the spirit by the Bible. Yeah, sure they are. A lot of them are like that. And you judge whatever spirit that you think you have by the Bible. Don't ever let anybody diminish the scripture. And uh, he said these people spend way too much time reading the Bible and not near enough time in, in the communion with God. And I mean, it was one slam right after another against the scripture. And uh, the, uh, uh, that, I mean, red flags should be flying up everywhere when you hear that kind of garbage coming out of the mouth of someone. So if I have a spirit, that spirit is subject to the prophets or subject to the prophets. The spirit will be subject to the word of God. Amen. If I have the Holy Spirit in me, what the Holy Spirit in me will never conflict with God's written word. Amen. Right. Amen. Never. Amen. There will never be a conflict with the written word of God. That's right. And if you go by the idea that your spirit judges the Bible, then it's all relative anyway. Right. There's nothing absolute about it. And the Bible is absolute. So he said, study the scriptures. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so if we divide it correctly, what dispensation are we living in? Exactly. Living in the dispensation of grace. What preceded immediately that dispensation of grace? Law. And there was a dividing line. Luke 16, 16. There's another division. A person becomes the division. The law and the prophets were until, and since that time the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. So there's another division in the scriptures. And on and on and on they go. Which is an, which is an enormous help in understanding the word of God. And the first thing that you'll run into with a young convert, a, a young believer, and it's an, it's an honest, innocent thing. It's honest and it's innocent. Is they'll read the Bible and they'll become overwhelmed with so much information in this book. And they'll wonder how it all fits. Well, there's nothing in the world wrong with someone asking you that. Say, they'll say, well, I just can't make sense of a lot of this. What's this talking about? Where does this fit? And, uh, and, and, and things of that nature. That's fine. And that's where you need to be able to come to them and help them along the way and show them, uh, show them where we are. And I would start with the New Testament and work backward. Because the New Testament is the final revelation. And I would work backward. So is the first five books of the Bible then therefore? That's a division. The first five books of the Bible were written by who? Moses. Moses. Exactly. Only the part where they talked about his body being buried. Uh, apart from that, he wrote every bit of it. And why did Moses write it? Because God told him to write a book. He told him plainly, write a book. And this means that Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy is one book. Not five. One, the Pentateuch consists of five separate books, but in the mind of God, it's one book. And that's why, that's why Genesis, the Revelation, is one book. That's right. Amen. You, one book, 39 and 27. 
It's one book. It's one complete book, all 66 uh, books of the Bible. So the first five books of the Bible become the foundation for everything else in Scripture. And if you don't believe the first five books of the Bible, you certainly will not believe anything else in the Word of God. You show me anybody who denies what the Bible says about the creation and about Adam and, uh, and the fall of mankind, I'll show you a man who does not believe the Bible. He's a humanist. He's a, he's a self-worshipping, self-loving uh, humanist and has no regard for God or His Word. So in 2 Timothy chapter number 2 and verse 5, first 50, 2 Timothy 2.15, uh, let me get over here and find it. 2 Timothy 2.15. The scripture says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But, pro, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. Here again, we talk, he's warning against, uh, he's giving constant warnings against useless arguing about things that are not that important. Amen. The Apostle Paul sets things on level in, uh, levels of importance. And then he said in verse 17, The word will eat doth the canker, whom, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Now how could they teach that? How could they teach the resurrection is past already? All right, now if you'll remember... When the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, when He died on the cross, He died at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Well, from 12 till 3, from 12 till 3, the earth was in total darkness. And I believe the globe. I believe, from, I believe from, from cover to cover. I believe the entire earth was plunged into complete, total darkness. And then when He died, the earth shook. Shook. It shook. Probably the greatest earthquake the earth had ever known. That might have produced some geological changes on this earth that to this day they don't know about. But he shook the earth. And when he gave up the ghost. Yes, sir. They do have manuscripts in Egypt? Secular authority then. Yeah. Yeah, Egypt used... Okay. Well, see, Egypt is where the, uh, the uh, Gnostic Gospels came from, yeah. Nag Hammadi. Uh, and, darkness, absolutely. And that's what the Gnostic Gospels are, nothing but darkness. But they were dug up about 1947. Yeah. It's, it's remarkable how that the Gnostic Gospels showed up about the same time as the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You have the Dead Sea Scrolls that show up 46, 47, 48, over a period of time. They kept finding them. And then you have the Gnostic Gospels that came from Nag Hammadi, which is in Egypt. All right. So the, the, the Gnostic Gospels that come out of Egypt, nothing but pure darkness. That's all they are, darkness. But the Dead Sea Scrolls, not so. Because the 57-foot-long scroll of Isaiah, the prophet, agrees with the book you've got in your hand right there. And they say that these people were Essenes, and they'd separated from Jerusalem because the temple, as far as they were concerned, was defiled. And to this day, they still wonder about some of the prophecies that they found. They've got one copper scroll that was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the copper scroll talks about an enormous amount of wealth buried out there in the desert. So they're out there wandering around now trying to find that. I'll guarantee it. Believe me, if there's gold buried somewhere, they'll be after it. 1849 all over again. So, yes, if they record something that happens like that, it's just... It's just God confirming it through another witness that the darkness ensued. But now what happened at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, God shook the earth, shook the earth. And the Bible said the graves were opened in Jerusalem. They were opened. That's all that happened now. That's all that happened. They were opened. And then for three days they lay open. And probably, I mean, I don't know. Probably, you can't say one way or the other, but probably the family members of these loved ones' bodies buried in the graves probably stood guard over them for three days. They were open because the Bible says that many bodies of the saints arose and walked through the streets of Jerusalem after, that's important, after His resurrection. 
That in itself was a profound thing. Many, not all. So here for three days, these graves are lying open in Jerusalem. Three days. And on the third day when Christ arose from the dead, He is the resurrection and the life. Then these bodies get up and they start walking through the streets of Jerusalem. But not all of them did. That's amazing. You don't hear much about that. But that's exactly what the Bible says. And sure, and obviously there was a witness to it because the witness is in the Scripture. And obviously there were, there were eyewitnesses to the event. And so they walk through the streets of Jerusalem after His resurrection. What, what's that? That's, that's an attestation to His authority as the resurrection and the life. Amen. And not all of the bodies arose. That would have been a bad thing, wouldn't it? <laughs> the saints. Exactly. Herod the Great stayed where he was. <laughs> <laughs> of course, the problem with that is that he was buried at Herodium, <laughs> which, is a, which is a huge uh, thing he had built out there outside Jerusalem. But if he could have been there at Herodium, he'd still been there. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, there may be a, yeah, who knows? I mean, what do you, what do you, what do you say to that? He's, they, sure, they, they surely could not precede him. And there's no other event in the Bible anywhere like it. It's a one-time thing. And uh, so it happened, just like the Bible says it happened. You believe it happened. If you believe the Bible, you believe it happened. And, uh, and yes, sir. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. That's the, yeah, the human mind can play tricks on you. It sure can. That's why you're not, that's why you're not, you don't have to rely on the human mind. That's why you have a written record. That's why the Bible, being inspired, and, and every time you read it, you're reading the Word of God, which is inspired and inspires those who read it because it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes right off the pages of that book. So we walk through the streets of Jerusalem after His resurrection, and uh, it doesn't say what happened then. So, you know, y'all can go home this afternoon, sit around, think on it. It doesn't say. We don't know. But we do know that happened. A lot of times if the Holy Spirit doesn't tell you, then it's, you know, it's not, probably not that important. But uh, just like Lazarus, when he arose from the dead, uh, he had to die again, didn't he? He certainly did. He certainly did. But the, the wording is different. The wording is different. It says many bodies of the saints arose and walked through the streets of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, walk through the streets of Jerusalem. So that might be something you want to dig into a little bit and find out what's going on. But it's a, it's a strange thing. But no doubt about it, it happened. So now they're teaching over here that the resurrection is past already. They could be making reference to that. Or they could be saying that the resurrection is a spiritual thing. Just like the liberal teaches today that, oh, Christ arose spiritually. His message is alive in our hearts today. And Christ is alive in all of us today and blah, 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 blah. No, this same Jesus that you've seen gone away. In Acts chapter number 1. Bodily, physically, visibly shall so come again in like manner as you've seen him go. In other words, he rose physically from the dead. Destroy this temple, this tabernacle in three days. I will raise it up. Talking about his body. Thou wilt not suffer thy soul, leave thy soul in hell, or suffer thy holy one to see what? That's right, corruption. Amen. That's what Peter's talking about when he quoted the Old Testament. And the corruption, of course, has to do with the decay of the physical flesh. So it didn't happen. It didn't happen. Amen. So he arose from the dead. He arose right. from the dead physically. Right. So why is it so necessary for him to rise from the dead physically? Because it's his physical body that sat down at the right hand of, the, of God the Father, Amen. the body of the God-man, the body that never had original sin, the body that had pure, untainted blood, and it is that blood that becomes the basis of the covenant of your relationship with the Lord. Yes. It is that body that he said in the book of uh, Hebrews, a body thou hast prepared for me. Amen. He prepared that body unlike any other body. The Bible says likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That the Lord Jesus, according to the book of Romans chapter number 8, and like our, in the likeness of our sinful flesh, 
and for sin condemns sin in the flesh, but not the same body. There's a difference. There's a mystery attached to his body, folks. There's a mystery attached to the incarnation, and there's no way that you can, you can, move it, you can do away with it. You cannot, you'll never be able to fully understand the incarnation of God until you see him as he is. And God has to, by revelation, make that known to you. You won't find it out with your human brain, with your human mind. It's, you're incapable of that. We can find the double helix of the DNA. We can even find out all kinds of code. And they're finding new codes all the time, by the way. It's blowing their mind what they're finding. And you'd be amazed right now at how many so-called, uh, how many scientists have abandoned Darwin's ship. And they're abandoning it every day. And they're leaving it in droves. And DNA is one of the, uh, one of the reasons they're doing it, along with a lot of other things. So he, uh, they're teaching the resurrection is past already. But is it? All right, here's the thing. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, on such the second death hath no power. What is that? What's the first resurrection? The saints. Just put it that way. It's the simplest way to say it. Because the resurrection of the saints come in stages. See, stages. But it's the resurrection. The Bible said the day is coming, the hour is coming when all that are in the grave shall hear the voice of the Son of God and come forth. The voice of the Son of God and come forth. They that have done evil, the resurrection of damnation. They that have done good to the resurrection of life. Literally, the resurrection of damnation is not a resurrection in the sense of the resurrection of life. The resurrection of damnation is the casting forth of the dead. There is no giving of life. They're dead. They're dead spiritually. They'll remain dead, but they are conscious. They have an existence. It's called the second death. So it says in Revelation, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection on such the what? Second death hath no power. The resurrection, therefore, is broken up into stages. And the first part, the first fruits of the resurrection, the very first of the resurrection, has to do with a person Amen. because he became the first fruits of them that slept. And who is that? That's the Lord Jesus. What does it mean? Because Lazarus arose from the dead before Christ did. But he died again, didn't he? He died again. That's why first fruits means, as it relates to Christ, never to die again. Amen. The first fruits of the resurrection and all that follow afterward in the stages that come. Take the tribulation period, for example. It starts with a resurrection. There's one in the middle of it, and it ends with one. There's three resurrections that take place within a period of seven years in the, trip, in the, trib, in, in the tribulation period. Three of them within a period of seven years. So, you know, you, the, here's my problem with my dear brothers and sisters that are post anomalous They've got one. <laughs> you remember in John chapter number 11 when the Lord showed up and Mary and Martha had buried their brother Lazarus? You remember that? Let's go back and read that for a moment. I want to show you something in here. And they don't come any better than Mary and Martha. They don't come any better. Uh, in John 11, in verse number 22, let's go to verse 21. Then Martha said, Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, Whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Now watch this. Now, I, I love the way the Lord probes with a question. <laughs> he probes. <laughs> Jesus saith unto her, thy brother shall rise again. All right. Now, he didn't ask her a question, but he did give her a question. Because it caused her to give an answer. Now watch verse 24. Martha said to him, I know that he shall rise again. Now watch this. In the resurrection, when? At the last day. Now Martha's theology is limited. Her eschatology is based on a limited understanding. Exactly. It's based on a limited understanding. Now watch the way he does her. Verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection <laughs> and the life. Not a day, me. Not a day, me. I am the resurrection 
and the life. Now, of course, being a child of God, Martha and Mary, she accepted it. Anything that came forth from the mouth of the Son of God, if they're true believers, they accept it. They accept it. And uh, that's, of course, she did. So the resurrection's not a simple thing, is it? No, it's not. It's not a simple thing. So when you come over here to 2 Timothy and, uh, and, these, uh, and their teaching that the resurrection, Hymenaeus and Philetus are saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. So that hurts someone. I mean, here they are thinking, well, good night. If I've missed the resurrection, I've missed it all. Then apparently I believed in vain. You see, I have believed in vain. Now the Apostle Paul gets into very gets into great detail. If you'll look at 1 Corinthians 15, I'll just pick a couple of these out. It's a long chapter. But in 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul gets into great detail about how the resurrection takes place. What happens? Look at verse number 15. 1 Corinthians 15, 15. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we've testified of God that He raised up Christ whom He raised not up. That's a hypothetical situation. If so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised? And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. And then they which all slow are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. And if this our life only we had hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. In other words, if there's no resurrection, this is all we live for. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. And then he continues on and tells you how it happens. Look at verse 23. Every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they are Christ, they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to, the, of, to God, even the Father, and put all authority and rule and power. All right. So when he deals with this in 1 Corinthians 15, Notice what he even gets into so much detail as it relates to the body. Look at verse number 44. 1 Corinthians 15, 44. It, the body, is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There's a natural body and there's a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. Afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Amen. The Lord Jesus is called two things here in verses 45 and 47. He's called the last Adam and he's called the second man. And both of them relate in the context to the resurrection. So the resurrection, has it passed? Has the resurrection passed? Past already? Is it over? No, it's not over. The resurrection has started. Yes, it started. The first resurrection has started because Christ was the first fruits. And now here we are 2,000 years later, still in the starting of the first resurrection. So what happens next, preacher? Look what the apostle says in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. Now look at this thing. Verse 13. <coughs> but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. That's a euphemism for being gone. In other words, it's a word that takes the bite out of death. The truth of the matter is they're not dead. He that liveth and believeth in me shall what? Never die. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. The sleep now, the ones that are gone. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God raise from the ground. Did I get that wrong? That's what they teach. That's what a lot of theology gets. What does the Bible say? He'll bring them with him. That makes a big difference, doesn't it? I remember 35 years ago, I talked to a dear lady. She was in her late 80s. And we were talking about the resurrection. And she had never in all of the years that she'd been in church 
ever even thought about the fact that the Bible says they that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So where are they? Oh, is he in the ground? And there are those who teach that, that the saved or the saints are in the ground. And the ones who teach that are dichotomists for the most part. They believe that, that you are not body, that you are not a spirit living in a body and you have a soul. They believe the spirit and the soul are synonymous and that you have a body, that you're living in a body. They can't make the difference. They can't see the difference. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be what? Present. Present with the Lord. So they that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. He said, therefore, sorrow not as others which have no hope. All right. Here we have the apostle telling the church at Thessalonica, look forward for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. He's coming again. So Hymenaeus and Philetus are dead wrong. If they're teaching that the resurrection is past already, I will take the Apostle Paul in a heartbeat over Hymenaeus and Philetus. Yeah. Amen. You see? But you have to do, you have to look at it, you've got to compare the two. So why would they want to teach that though? Why would Hymenaeus and Philetus, why would they want to teach that? It's just like the thing I've told you time and time again. If it doesn't make any sense, somebody's making money on it, right? <laughs> All right, if you get a bunch of theology that seems so messed up, there's an agenda. They are, they are actively, consciously trying to, to put down the truth and build their own little theology, their own little system. And, uh, and this goes on all the time. That's right, literally true. And it's spiritual, it's real too. It's literal. They don't grasp. They have no sense. Yes, sir. I'll tell you a true story. I was a young kid. I was the chief attendant in the St. Louis Hospital in New York, and I had a team of orderlies that when we had a cold red, that's when something crashed. Yeah. We had to get there, and had to get my guys there, and I always taught them to use the stairs and move their bags and start bringing a crash car in. It was a man that had cardiac arrest. Y'all listening to this? <laughs> Did you hear it? And he said he could see everything we did. We left the body side. I was above somewhere, and I watched you guys get the, uh, you know, resuscitated and shocking him. And I was just a young Well, the he that was talking to you is the he that saw all of that, not the body. Exactly. He was in the body one moment, out of the body the next. That's what the Apostle Paul said. Whether in the body or out of the body cannot tell. It's quiet, I'm guaranteeing. It's, it's bound to be.
listen to his heart and he was still ticking. Oh boy. He wasn't quite dead yet, you know. <laughs> I had to call him the floor and I said, you guys want to talk about it? Yeah. Oh. And they had to pick him back up to a room. That's the scary part. I mean, that, that really is. No, I, you want to make absolutely certain you got a dead body there, not to Let's let him get cold. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably wiser than a lot of the doctors because some doctor pronounced him dead. Well, absolutely. You wouldn't, you, nobody in there, that's a, half a human would want to cut into somebody if you're not sure they're dead. No. Boy, what a thing. Oh, I've got four or five books that's full of that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I mean, you're, you're, you're the first person, though, that I've heard give that testimony. Well, you know good and well, there's no way he could have known you jerked that gurney or whatever it was through that, through that, yeah, the, the car, yeah, the cart. There's no way he could have known that. No way he could have known that. He was around the corner, down in the room, at, at, right, and you were probably 75, 100 feet away from him around the corner. Now, see, that's where people, they, they get on the fence, and they're not sure which way they're going to go with what you just said. Yeah. But if you, if you have doubts about stuff like that, read 2 Corinthians 12, folks. Yeah. Read 2 Corinthians 12. And uh, also, when outside of Lystra, the Apostle Paul, that's probably what he's referring to, is he was stoned at Lystra, and they left him for dead yeah. at Lystra. They stoned him, and that's probably where that happened that he's talking about in 2 Corinthians 12. <laughs> I think I've, I've heard his testimony. Yes. Yeah. He met, wasn't it something where he met grandfather or somebody that there's no way he could have known anything about? And he, he, he gave details that blew his parents away that confirmed to them that there was something that happened. Well, what you look for in stuff like this, you always look for it, is things, you look for things that there is no way they could have known. No way. No way. And then it's confirmed later that it happened. True. Color, person, uh, you know, detail, cart, this or that, whatever. There's no way they could have known it. And uh, so what does it mean? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Oh, he's talking to his grandfather when he was when his grandfather was in his twenties. Yeah, he wasn't an old man no more. He was in his, he was a young man in his twenties, and when his mother got the picture from some relatives, he she showed it to the boy, and he oh. said, "That's who I was." Talking oh, okay. About. Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> and that even adds more weight to it. So he, he saw his grandfather when his grandfather was when his in his twenties, then confirmed it by a photograph that the, the child four years old. Yeah. Had never seen. No. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> no senior citizens, huh? <laughs> yes.
That's exactly right. It's nothing. It's an empty. Uh-huh. I understand. The person's gone. That's just an empty vessel. They're just gone. Yes, sir. We're going to have to go. Yes, sir. You know the testimony of Kim Mackin? Yes. Yes, I do. They had told his family to prepare for a funeral. He was, he was, as far as they were concerned, giving up for dead and all that. And God completely reversed Tim Macklin. Completely. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's pray and we'll let you go.